think the fun thing is is you see the silhouette. You know, and that's fucking him. And so, uh, so you, you just come in ready to blast this guy to smithereenies, as uh, somebody say, I would say. Ethan was a lovely guy. You know, it's always nice to work with people whose you know, work you admire and they turn out to be nice people. He's very enthusiastic and passionate and it's so wonderful to see someone who's had the breadth of experience he's had and still have that driving passion that searches for a truth in the moment every day. He really goes after each scene as if every little moment counts. So with the fizzle bomber, I thought, well, if he'd been through this process of going through time so often, he'd be a little bit crazy. He'd probably let himself go because he had this grand sense of a larger purpose. So he'd let go of grooming and there would be all these other accidents that he'd been through on other missions. So we started to think, instead of just white hair and stipple, we looked at other ways, like, let's give him like uh, this longer beard, let's give him longer hair, let's make his eyesight messed up, let's give him scars from a previous mission, and also just uh, some rotten dentures as if teeth had been damaged. And originally, when we got the long-haired wig, we were going to put it on him and just cut it to the right length. I remember the first initial makeup test where Ethan was standing in front of the mirror and he put the wig on, and just as he was putting the wig on, his whole posture changed. And I just knew that it was the right thing. We didn't cut it after that. It just worked. And then just from that, uh, Ethan just took it to this whole new level. Every movie that's ever dealt with time travel, uh, from Time Bandits forward that I've ever seen in my life, there's a certain joy you get out of trying to unravel the mystery. But if you did that, then wouldn't that change that? And if that was changed, wouldn't that be different? You have no idea what's right for me. All we have is each other. It is all we've ever had. Now, if you shoot me, you'll become me. You realize that if time travel exists, they're with us now. Which is really scary, which is so true as well, because where would you go? If, if I invented time travel in the future, where would I go? Visit myself back in the past. If you could go back, whether that would affect your present and future anyway. Uh, it fascinates people. Although you can buy time machines on the internet, apparently. Uh, I'm not saying they work. Some people say that it's fake. But you and I, we know. Some things are predestined. And I made you who you are. You made me who I am. It's, it's a paradox, right? But it can't be paradoctored. <laughs> so within the concept of predestination there's the million dollar question is is everything preordained or can events be altered or are you always stuck in a loop no matter what alterations you do the end will be the same. Whether there is fate or chance or only predestination. That's what I find most captivating about the movie or anything having to do with time travel is the nature of, of fate and the nature, nature of free will, and why is it in our lives that every time something's happened, it feels like it was inevitable, like that was the way it was always meant to be? I feel like it may only be predestination. You can change little bits, but we're all kind of stuck on a path. When we're imagining our future, it seems as if it could go in so many thousands of directions. I think that is at the essence of what is interesting about the idea of predestination. And some people, like Barkeep, Unmarried Mother, Jane, Fizzle Bomber, they're all stuck on the same path and it just is a bit of a tragic one. The editor tends to start on a film just at the end of pre-production. I come in and the shoot begins and it allows me to basically start telling the story as it's being shot. Of course I'm cutting all the way through the shoot basically just assembling the footage as we go and it's not until the shoot is finished and we and we set up in true post-production that the honing of the story actually begins. That's the fun time, you know, the, the directors and myself sit down and mine the footage for the best way to tell the narrative. The pumping station was a great location that we found sort of last minute. You could walk straight into the building, not have to build or touch a thing. It's an impressive place to shoot in. It's an interesting thing, film noir. 
because of course it's as much about the content of the story as it is about the way that it looks in by definition but from my perspective I've tried to use shadow and shadow play a lot We also added in this thriller element, which didn't really exist in the short story. There was maybe one or two sentences in the short story about stopping a fizzle bomb, and, and we took that and kind of created a, a villain around that, that concept. Three, two, one, go! So the burn makeup was an issue unto itself because for me, it was the, the one opportunity we had to create a transition between Sarah and Ethan's look. Because when we got the, the head cast of Sarah and the head cast of Ethan, they were so distinctly different. There's no way we could have just explained it away as, you know, skin grafts or something like that. There had to be something structurally that was damaged. There's always that risk when you do a burn makeup that you can end up in the land of burnt pizza. Steve's sculpt from the start made sure that it wasn't going to end in that direction. On Sarah's head cast, we created a burn makeup where I just put a lot of uh, Ethan's proportions back in there, like the length of his chin, the top of a brow, creating bigger ears, even though they're all melted off. But just starting with that foundation. Which took a while, it was about six hours. So there's like a, a cowl that goes on your back, like um, as if you're wearing a hat that extends to below your shoulders, and then there's a pieces that go around your eyes and then around your mouth. Dentures to make it look like her teeth had all been destroyed. And we also had these contact lenses made. I designed them very specifically to make it look like the pupils had all been steamed. And then they have to spray it and then they have to paint it. And they stick bits of hair on the top to make it look like I've had burnt hair. The crowning glory to make this whole makeup look real is they put KY jelly all over my face. Everywhere, just rub it in, all over to make it look really like fresh and burnt and bloody. Sitting in set with a face full of lubricant. It's an interesting thing though, because when you see people and you talk to them, you can't see what you look like. So you're talking normally, not like a Burns victim. And they're talking to you a bit like this. Like, hey, are you okay? Can I get you something? Can I get you some water? <laughs> no, I'm fine. What, you, what have I got something on my face? <laughs> Well, I'm playing this fight scene where I'm fighting myself in another time period. And so, who would win such a fight? The idea we had was that he was well matched. There's a technical thing about it that is really difficult because every, usually if you're doing a fight scene, if your coverage is not good, if a hit doesn't sell on your coverage, they can cut to the other coverage. But if you're fighting yourself, it's always you. And so there's, it becomes more difficult to make it work. 